All right, well, let's pray as we get into this. Father, thank you for this day, for your blessings, for your goodness. And we pray, Father, even right now that you would just have your way, that you would take over, that your words would just come through with clarity and that we would have hearts to receive and ears to hear what you want us to receive. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're hitting Hidden Treasures Part 2, or Hidden Treasures 2, Part 2 today. Now, the only thing that changed was the colors on this, right? Hidden Treasures 2, Bryce brought Part 1 last week. I heard some great things about the, the message the Lord gave Bryce. And today is Part 2 of Hidden Treasures 2. And, uh, and, and I don't want to give the title away too soon because it will let you know right where we're going. So we want to build up some suspense first. And I'll, I'll start by just telling you, Something that happened to me, and I love this. Let me just share a key verse for the series. Same one as part one. Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. So that's what Hidden Treasures is about, this two-part, two-month series, where we're just going into things in God's Word, and we're gleaning out some treasures of truth that we just take right into our, our lives. Amen? So in that, uh, uh, about, about two weeks ago, I was riding down the road. I remember exactly where I was. You can't remember every moment, but some moments you can never forget. And this is one of those never forget moments for me. I'm riding down the road. Jen had gone to Greenville to get her hair done. I'm being real specific. She's going to get her hair done, right? Me and Jonas are hanging back. We went and got some tacos. We played at the park. We did the slide. We went and got some tacos. We are on our way home. And if you know where I live, uh, I'm, I'm about near the Dollar General. And right there near the Dollar General, I heard something so loud in my spirit. And it's funny how the Lord can just give you two or three words, but it speaks volumes to you. And in those two or three words, I heard three words that just spoke volumes to me. Here's what I heard. You ready? When the lost. When the lost. And I knew instantly what he was saying, and I knew why he was saying it. And the reason he was saying it to me in that moment is I had gotten distracted. I'd gotten a little distracted. And, and my distraction came, by the way, of frustration. I was dealing with some things, and, and, and some these things, some in the way of people, were getting on my nerves, and I was getting frustrated. And it seemed like that was all that I could think about was some frustration that I was feeling and, and, and it just, it just overtake my mind. You ever had things just overtake your mind and it can be a negative thing and it just, it's like all you can seem to think about. Like, you, you know, you're not focusing on the 99 amazing things God's doing in your life. It's just that one thing, one represents one percentile of some frustration. And I was coming to the realization, I was just being reminded that you will never please everybody all the time. It's impossible. Like if you have a family of more than two in your family, even if you got a family of two, you and your wife, you'll never hit it 100% every time in terms of where you want to eat dinner or what you want to eat for dinner. Uh, my wife is one that she will, we got into a heated discussion. It wasn't heated, heated, but it was, <laughs> it was intense about dinner because I asked her, said, hey, where do you want to go to dinner? And she told me, and then after she told me, she said, well, what were you thinking? I said, well, I was actually thinking this, but I like your idea, so let's do your idea, right? Well, she ended up, she ended up kind of like giving over to what she thought I wanted. And then she's trying to convince me that what I wanted is really what she wanted. So we're headed to what I wanted. But then in the discussion from Washington to Greenville, I really discovered that what I wanted wasn't really what she wanted. She was just doing what she thought I wanted because she was trying to please me. And so I finally discovered that what I wanted wasn't what she wanted. And so I'll never be able to repeat all this again like that. I'll have to play this back. But, but in that, it brought me some frustration because I'm thinking, I just, I just want to ask you what you want to eat. And I'm asking you not because it's a trick question. There's no landmines. I just get pleasure out of pleasing you. And, and if there's something you want, that just brings me joy. And, and I got that through her, through her, through, through, through to her. Got it through to her. But even, listen, even in a party of two, you won't please everybody every time. If you've got more in your organization or your team or your workplace, you're typically, you're typically going to run into somebody that's disgruntled about something 
The music's too loud, the temperature's too cold, this is this way, this is that way. And it can be the most minuscule of things that become, can, can be big. We're going to talk about that in just a second, about how we deal with that. But I was feeling that, and here's what I heard the Holy Spirit say to me. Win the lost. He had to remind me in three words. This reminder got me back on track, and it was just those three words that just said a volume to me that spoke to me, hey, this is what you're here for. Like, remind yourself not to get distracted by any of these peripheral things. Your job isn't even to please everybody. Your job is to follow what I'm calling you to do. And what I'm calling you to do is win the lost. And I even knew in that phrase, win the lost, that that was even speaking to Christians. You know that there are lots of lost Christians? What's a lost Christian? A lost Christian is a person that doesn't know where home is in the moment. They don't know where home is. Like, they're saved and they're going to heaven. That's their future home. But they don't realize that in the moment, there's a salvation for them to live in in the moment. And so they're lost while they're found. There's lots of those. There's lots of lost believers and lost Christians. And so I knew when he said this word, win the lost, that he was, say, he was saying to me, hey, I want you to go after people that are lost. People that don't know that heaven's their home. But listen, those that are born again believers, they don't even know where home is. They don't know that Jesus is the source for their provision. That Jesus is the source for their healing. That, that everything they need for life and godliness is found in him. They don't know that. And so I want you to win the lost. And so that helped me. It helped me. And it got me back on track. And then I'm thinking from that new perspective of that reminder, win the lost, win the lost. I'm thinking, wow. So like, why do I even get frustrated sometimes when things pop up here or pop thing up, up there? Why, why, why does that happen? And then the Lord reminded me of Nehemiah. And somehow I knew in this series we were going to fit Nehemiah in somewhere. I didn't know where we were going to do it, how it was going to show up. But it was right then that he showed me. He says, listen, in this, in this journey of the Christian life, in the process of winning the lost, you're going to need your sword and you're going to need a trowel. You're going to need both. And that was another, that was just another volume of message that came to me. Like I knew instantly what the Lord was saying. And it just so reminded me of this entire story of Nehemiah and what Nehemiah went through as he's going back to Jerusalem to build the wall. I want to give the short version of that story. And I want to bring it into practical, practical for us. How do we take this out of here? How do I, how do I walk out these doors and walk into life knowing how to use my sword and my trowel? Now, I hope I'm saying that right. But a trial is what masons use, brick masons. Am I saying that right? If I'm saying that right, somebody raise their hand just to wave at me. Nobody's waving at me. I'm sitting, there's a guy over there. He's a, he's a plumber, so he's been around construction. I know he knows what he's talking about, right? Here's what happened with Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes. I don't even know if I said his name right, but uh, that was a good stab. He was a cupbearer. He was the cupbearer because Israel had been taken captive. They got in, they had gotten into idolatry, idol worship. And the Lord told him, He said, When you do this, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're gonna be taken captive. And they were. And the Babylonians came, took him captive, King, ne King Nebuchadnezzar. But then Nebuchadnezzar was defeated. And now the these uh, these people that were Israelites are scattered between some nations and some regions. And this one guy, Nehemiah, he found, finds himself working for this king as a cupbearer, King Artaxerxes, and he's serving as the cupbearer. What's the cupbearer do? He tastes the wine before it's given to the king just to make sure it's not poison. And that's, that was that secret service of that day. That's how this, their secret service worked. He's working as a secret service agent for the king, tasting the wine, making sure, make sure it's not poison. And he gets a sad countenance on his face in front of the king. He wasn't trying to hide it, but he was probably like me. You know, I'm one of those people where... You just know where I'm at. There's not much guessing with me. You just pretty much know where I'm at. And, and you can tell that on Nehemiah's face. And, and it was worrisome because he knew he was supposed to be pleasant when he approached the king. But the king saw his troubled face and he said, Nehemiah, what's wrong with you? Why is your countenance so low? Nehemiah basically responds to the king. He says, I've heard from some of my friends that, were, that had just returned from Jerusalem. And they told me how the walls have been burned down and thrown down and the gates have been burned. And, and the city that I love and cherish is in utter ruin. So I'm, I'm just, I'm hurting. And the king says, well, what can I do for you? What can I do to help? And, and, and in this was a Holy Spirit move of God where King Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah the commission, permission, and the provision 
to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls and rebuild the gates of the city. And so he goes back and he goes back with all the timber, all the supplies. He's got letters of commission for when he goes back for other suppliers to, to give him the provisions as to what he needs. He has everything he needs, even a guard going with him. And he gets back to Jerusalem and he sets, he sets into the business of rebuilding the walls. And the Lord was speaking that to me about when the loss, he says, he says, building the wall is like Nehemiah. It's just one brick at a time. One brick at a time. I remember in the ninth grade, ninth or 10th grade, my friend Kevin Sugg, his dad Melvin Sugg was a brick mason. He did a lot of different things, but one of the things he was good at was being a brick mason. And my friend Kevin said, hey, come help us for the summer. What am I going to do? He said, we're going to push brick. I didn't know what pushing brick was, but pushing brick means you got the wheelbarrow to the brick pile. You fill the wheelbarrow up with the brick and you pushed it all the way to where the guys are, the masons, and you just keep them supplied with bricks and with mortar. And that sounded easy until I filled that wheelbarrow up and went to pick that thing up and I couldn't move it. And then I had to learn what I could handle. What, what is this muscle? Is that your lats? I had the biggest, whatever trap. that muscle is. Trap. Right? That's your trap. I had the biggest traps that summer from working in brick masonry. And all I did was push brick. But here's what got me. They would start on a wall and I would get this thought in my mind, though I'd never say it. I'd get this thought and that is, y'all will never finish this. This is massive. How are you going to finish this? It just takes so long. And just, but here's what I noticed. One brick at a time built the wall. Just one brick mm -hmm. at a time built the wall. And then we would look back. They would do an acid wash on the, on the brick, spray it down, and we'd all look back. And they were checking it for any defects. And I'm just marveling. Like, how did they actually do that? And then you look at massive, big brick structures. And how did that happen? It happened one brick at a time. And when the Lord spoke to me the other week and he reminded me of my mission and my calling, and that is to win the loss. He says, I want you to do it like Nehemiah did, one brick at a time. I want you to build the wall of salvation, one brick at a time. And this may not mean anything to you. This is my personal story. This is what the Lord was reminding me of. He said, I want you to build the wall, rebuild the walls of salvation, one brick at a time, one person at a time. I want you to rebuild the walls of salvation. But, he, but, but then he, he gives me this wisdom. He said, but like Nehemiah, you're going to need your sword and your trowel. You're going to need the trowel. And I, if you've ever watched anyone that knows how to lay brick, I mean, I'd watch Mr. Sud grab a, the, the perfect amount of, of mortar, slap it on that row of bricks. He'd put a brick there. He'd tap it in. He'd scoop off the excess. And it was perfect. And I mean, I, it just, it's a skill, you know, watching someone do their skill. I would watch him do their skill. And the Lord is saying, listen, you, you need your trial to build the wall one soul at a time. But while you're building it, you need that sword of protection. And it makes sense. Because when Nehemiah got back to Jerusalem to rebuild those walls, you would have thought everybody would have been happy. And I will say that 98% of the people were. But there were a couple of people, Sanballat and Tobiah, who did not want to see that wall be rebuilt at all. And they viciously attacked Nehemiah. And their attack, though it didn't start out in any physical manner, it, 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 it almost became physical. It was through words. It was through put downs. It was through attitude. It was through all kinds of things they were projecting upon Nehemiah. And the threats and the intimidation was coming in so strong that Nehemiah had a team that were standing behind the workers with their bows and their spears and their swords while, while the workers had a sword strapped to their side and the trowel in the other hand building the walls back. And so the Lord reminded me of this, said, win or loss, it, it's like Nehemiah. I'm like, like Nehemiah. And I just felt like he was showing me. He said, listen, you can't do this without the sword and the trowel. And here's a thought that came to my head. Would it not be so much quicker and easier if I didn't have to have a sword? If I could just go with both of my hands working to be to rebuild that wall. Then you got to remember, if you read that story in Nehemiah, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in record time. Amazing how fast they did it. Everybody came together, family by family, on the wall, building their section, building their part. It was incredible what they got done in a short period. But my thought was, how much quicker could they have done it? 
if they could have devoted both hands to the work. But here's the reality. Here's a newsflash. You ready? That's never going to happen. That is never, ever, ever going to happen. And I don't want to shock you. I was a little shocked myself the way the Lord put it to me. But here's the deal. As long as you have an adversary that his main focus is to steal, kill, and destroy, you better have a sword. You better have a sword while you're building. Now, just so you don't ever forget this message, I brought my props. Can you hand these to me? Can you hand those to me? Uh, Yep. Thank you, sir. I brought these props. I went to Lowe's last night and got this trowel. I left the tag on it because I'm taking this thing back after church. <laughs> this thing was $17. Now, this ain't even the nice one. The nice one was like $40, $45. Bucks. I said, I ain't even paying $45 for something I'm going to use in a sermon. So I left, the, I left the tag on it. But there's a trowel. This thing right by itself, though, looks like a weapon, doesn't it? Yeah. It does look like a weapon. You could put a stick on the end of that and hurt somebody, right? But it's a trowel, and it's designed to get that mortar. Put it on that brick, right? And stack the brick. And then they'll take it. They'll, they'll, they'll do this, right? They'll scoop. And this is what Mr. Sugg did. He, and he put the brick on. He'd go. And he'd go to the next one. Just one brick at a time. And they had the patience. Look, one brick at a time. And the Lord said to me, he said, hey, while you're building the kingdom, while you're winning the loss, one person at a time. And that is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? I mean, I look back at that wall that like we baptized. Genesis was the last person we baptized. There's, there's, there's just nothing like it, right? Like when you come in here on a Sunday and you see the baptistry out, it's going to be a really good Sunday around here, right? There's nothing like it. I mean, it is a celebration. It's amazing, right? But it's not made possible without this, without this. Now, this is really neat, too. A friend of mine gave me this. Larry White gave me this. If Larry watches this, he, I'm giving him credit. This is called a Mameluke sword. And this has some, it's a Marine Corps non-commissioned officer sword. And I always wanted one. I never had one. And Larry gave me one. Larry, Bryce went to visit Larry in South Carolina. And Bryce, Larry gave this to, to, to Bryce. He said, Bryce, when you get home, I want you to give this to Johnny. Johnny will know exactly what this is and what this represents. And then I think Larry messaged me a few weeks later. said, did you get that thing I got you? Like one thing, it was still in the, Bryce's trunk in his car. <laughs> he had it still in the trunk in his car. He was like, oh yeah, Bryce did tell me to get that. See, see, and, I, and I love Bryce. But see, Bryce has no clue what this represents and what it means because it, he didn't, it had taken 13 weeks to earn the title of being a Marine. But there's a Marine or two in here. I know who you are. You know, you, you knew what that was when you saw it. That's a Mameluke sword. It has a story. You learn about it through the book. They call it the Book of Knowledge in boot camp. You learn about the history of the Marine Corps and the Mameluke sword and how that was given as a gift to the Marines for their, for the, for the, somebody help me. Come on. Mike Moore, uh, Danny, where you at? That was at the bit, uh, the Battle of Tripoli, right? And this prince gave it to the Marines as a, as a gift to commemorate how they went in and fought for them and, and won their freedom back. So it's the Mameluke sword. It's the NCO sword, and it's really cool. I mean, it's beautiful. It's just neat, right? Come on. Is it neat? That's neat, right? <laughs> right. And I never had to do this thing in formation, but you pull it out. You do it like this, right? Boom, 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 and you bring it up, right? And I'm rusty, right? I'm rusty. But think about this. Listen to this. This is an interesting combination. Can you imagine this? Here they are working, and this is what it looked like. Isn't that amazing? And you think about this, and you say, well, is that even biblical? Because I know Jesus said, you get slapped in the face, you turn the other cheek, right? I got verses for that. You ready? I got some verses for you. I got some verses for you. We're celebrating Palm Sunday. But did you know right before the crucifixion, right before the crucifixion, Jesus told the disciples to grab their sword? It's, it's, it's kind of like one of those quick little stories that you can bypass. It's found in Luke 22, 31 through 38. Simon and Jesus are having a confrontation. Luke 22, uh, 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 Jesus is speaking to Simon. He says, Simon, Simon. Now he's calling him Simon because he's, his Simon was out. Now sometimes his Peter would show up and the Peter was the rock part of him. We've all got two parts in us. You do know that, right? You know, there's Pastor Johnny that some of you think, but then there's really Johnny. My wife sees that Johnny, right? And, and this is really interesting. You gotta be able to, be familiar and it not be contemptuous for you. Thank God my wife is like that. Thank God those in my family, because they see the real me all the time. 
but yet they still love me and they encourage me in my calling. Isn't that interesting? Peter had a Peter. That was that part of him that was unmovable, unshakable. But then he also had that Simon in him. And that Simon was wavy like a wave. That's what it actually means, wavy like a wave. And Jesus would call him by the name that he was acting like in the moment. And right now he's saying, Simon. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Now here's Peter's response. Peter said, he's trying to be the rock in the moment. Peter said, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and even die for you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times or deny three times that you ever knew me. And then Jesus asked them, now this is interesting. He asked them, when I sent you out to preach the good news and you did not have money or traveler's bag or an extra pair of sandals, did you need anything? No, they replied. But now, he said, take your money and your traveler's bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. For the time has come for this prophecy about me to be fulfilled. He was counted among the rebels. Yes, everything written about me by the prophets will come true. Lord, Lord, they replied, we have two swords among us. That's enough, he said. That's amazing. Now we don't typically read that section of the story about Easter on Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday, but there's a discourse going that's happening that's going down, and Jesus is telling them, now, I, don't, I, I can't even profess to tell you, I understand every bit of that. In fact, there's a lot of debate about what that actually means in the moment. But here's what jumps out at me. Listen, you've got to be able to go with the flow, even with the Word of God. Like, the Word of God doesn't change, but God's going to speak specifically into certain situations and circumstances at a, at a moment and a time. And if you're not careful what you thought worked then, you'll try to take right into the next thing that you're facing. But God may say, no, I'm going to change this up completely. I'm going to shift it. And now I want you to go to this. He's basically saying, hey, could you trust me enough that when I told you that you didn't need uh, your sandals, you didn't need a change of clothes, you didn't need a money bag, that you were going to be taken care of when I sent you out to preach the gospel, did, did that prove to come true? And they responded by saying, yes. My wife kind of gave a great illustration. Hey, have I ever let you down? Have I ever not provided for you? I don't even know how to give you some banana food. And, and, and that was her story. That spoke to her, right? I mean, come on, the gospel through banana food. That's amazing, right? But here's what he said. He said, now you trusted me then. Now I want you to trust me now. I want you to get your sandals, get your bag, get your change of clothes, and I want you to get some swords. And they're looking for swords. They said, if you don't have a sword, sell a cloak and go buy one. And they looked around and they found two swords and they took them and they took them. And then he speaks of what God had sent him to do and how, I'm I'm paraphrasing, come hell or high water, I'm going to accomplish what the Father has sent me to do, like it or not. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Same Jesus that said, turn the other cheek. Today he's saying, get your sword. Get your sword. And interestingly, interesting, listen, Peter used the sword. He used the sword. He used the sword. You remember the story in the Garden of Gethsemane when when they came to get him. What did he do? He took the sword and he whacked off a a, a guard's ear with the sword. And and on two occasions we see in the Gospels and two of the writings where Jesus picked up and he healed that servant's ear right in front, which would have been enough for me to say, this really is the Messiah. Nobody else could have done that. Let's leave this dude alone. But they just kept on, Right? And say, here's what Peter was misunderstanding. Peter was thinking, yes, Lord, whatever God's calling you to do, we're going to protect you. I ain't denying you. I'll die for you if I need to. But can I help you? What Peter really needed the sword for was himself. Was himself. Bryce preached my whole message this morning to our group while we were eating biscuits at 830. So I'm just going to repeat it again. There was no collaboration, y'all, with Bryce and me other than the Holy Spirit. But here's what else I think the sword was for. You think you know somebody until they get disappointed. 
You think you know who somebody is until they get disappointed. And, and, and like people can get unhinged in a moment when disappointment hits them really hard. And they can do some silly things, right? I mean, the whole Oscars thing, the big talk. Some disappointment had showed up in Will Smith's life to a point that he walked up on stage and slapped a dude for the whole world to see. You know what I'm saying? The Oscars came out and apologized for how they didn't handle it right. Okay, I get all that, right? But they weren't expecting to see how somebody could react based on a whole lot of disappointment they'd been through and how in one moment they reacted. Like you think you can even trust yourself, right? Until you get disappointed. Until something doesn't go the way you want and you don't get to do something the way you want to do it. And you get disappointed. You, I've seen more Christian folk get mad and disappointed over the silly stuff. Silly stuff. That they, and they never do that at their job, but they do it at church. It's like, come on, God is worth more than even your job. Right? Come on, God is worth more than your job. Like if you'll do that and say, hey, let's do it. Let's get the job done. Hey, we're here to it. We're here, we're here for eight hours. Let's give it our all, right? And you rally the team, but yet the same folks sometimes in church are just... They like being behind the veil, but they don't know how to act when they get back there. And they cause, they cause trouble. They sow discord. And, they're, and listen, you know what you need? You need a sword for that. The sword Peter needed to bring was a sword for himself. And I'm just going to be straight in his own little sneaky attitude. That's what he needed a sword for. And you know how I know this is true? Because Bryce already mentioned it. All those people that are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. On this Friday, by next Friday, are saying crucify, crucify, crucify. Much of the same people. The pastor that ordained me in ministry, he said something to me that I did not like, and he said it to me. He said, listen, I want to give you some advice. He said, don't be moved by the cheers or the jeers. The cheers or the jeers. I said, what's that? He said, the same people that are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, they say crucify, crucify, crucify. And he says, it usually is about the three to three and a half year mark. I'm like, Whoa. Like that just burst my bubble because I got all these hopes and dreams and visions of ministry. But he was telling me the truth. He was telling me the truth because I can look back in my own life and I can look back at some ministries that I was a part of. And at about the three, three and a half year mark, I got disgruntled. And I started talking and doing things and I had a little stinky attitude because I didn't know how to use the sword on myself. <laughs> Amen. And you know what I was doing? I was deflecting from the mission at hand, which was the mission to win the loss. And I've got news for you and me. You ready? How dare you? Like, who do you think you are? Get your sword. Because what's the sword going to do? Listen, Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 4, 12, the sword of God, listen, will cut and bring division between the soul and the spirit, cutting away the fleshly part of ourselves. And I need that every now and then. And I know you weren't expecting a sermon like this on Palm Sunday, but it's all about Palm Sunday. Because disappointment can bring the worst out of us if we're not careful. If we're not careful. Can I be honest with you? I've disappointed myself. I've disappointed myself more times than I won't even tell you about. And here's the truth of that. If I had just left myself in that place of disappointment, my disappointment of my own doing, because I didn't even know how to use a sword on myself, I would have, if I'd have stayed there, I would have missed out on some of the greatest blessings and promises and prophetic things God had spoken in my life if I'd have stayed right there in that place of disappointment. Sometimes you just need the sword. The cut, I know how you thought it was going to be. And they were all disappointed. They, were, they weren't just disappointed. They got mad. They got angry. Because this Messiah that they're waving the palm branches, which speaks of victory. They're saying, hey, you've already won this. You got my vote. I'm going to lay my stuff down and let you walk across my cloak. Come on, let's do this. By the next week, they're saying, crucify, crucify. You see, they're thinking that this Jesus is going to be the Messiah slash rescuer that, that was going to deliver them from Roman oppression, set them free, and bring them back to the good old days that they once remembered. But what if maybe even what you're walking through in the moment is God's way, though a different way, to get you where he wants you to be? Wow. And you know what Jesus was saying when he said, get the sword? 
Listen, he's saying, he's saying, listen, what we're going to do next is the crescendo of everything I've come here to do. And I need this to be protected. I need this to be protected. Protected, and here's where the enemy works, from without and from within. I need this to be protected. Sambalat and Tobiah, those were the two opposing forces. Tobiah means, who's my father? And the other one means strength. The enemy's strong. But you know who he works through often? People that don't know who they are in Christ. People that don't know who they are in Christ. And, and, and I'm just going to use a word here. Y'all just bear with me, okay? And as a result, they get bitter, they get mean, they get angry, and they become fake Christians. Fake Christians. Now, fake Christian is not somebody that thinks they're going to heaven that's not. They're actually going to heaven. They're going to heaven. And, and, and please understand that Jesus never used the word Christian. Uh, the Apostle Paul never used the word Christian. The word Christian was given to the church by another group of people because the, they acted and they looked like Christ. So the word Christian literally means little Christ. These people, these early followers of Jesus, the early church, they had become like Christ as they went about doing good, just like Jesus. They went into all the world preaching the gospel. And so a fake Christian is a Christian that, yes, I want to go to heaven, but I'm going to act like the devil between now and then. And it may not happen the way you may think. It may not be you out partying or doing drugs, but you've got these stinky little attitudes that, that God can't even get out of your life. Well, you know why? Because you won't get your sword out. Amen. You can hear a message about something that somebody else will say, man, that changed my life. And you can hear it and hear it and hear it. It ain't like it even, it ain't nothing to you. Thursday night, a couple of Thursdays ago, we were down in uh, Sebastian, Florida. And I was, I was there by invitation from a friend, friend of mine named Rick Karen. Rick's going to be with us in, next month. He's going to speak one Sunday. And Rick Karen has a group of people that's come together. They call it the gathering. And there were 25, 26 people that had come together. He said, I, want, I know you got this book coming out, and I want you to come share this with this group. And so we went down there, and we spoke on the Sozo life. And I shared this with these people. And do you know, and I know it was the first time these people had heard anything like that. But see, this is, this is where you got to be careful. Because familiarity can breed contempt. And this was mostly a group of senior citizens, by the way. And several of those people walked up to me at the end. And here's, here were their words. What you just said has changed my life. What I just heard. Now, I heard it once, and that's pretty amazing. But I heard it more than once. I heard it three or four times, and it was amazing. Because I knew the Lord was, was, had done something in these people's life. I shared the word sozo, the message. We took communion together. And, and, and several people came up and said, this has changed my life. Like, wow. We're about to leave. Uh, a couple mornings later, we're packing up to leave. And we've got the tailgate up on our van. Jen and I are putting stuff in the back of the van. And a gentleman rides up on his bicycle. He's 84. His name's Don. He may even be watching this right now live. He said he, he's watched several messages since that night we, we first met. Don walk, pulls up on his bike. And you yeah, understand, 84 there is different than 84 here. 84, we're in a rocking chair like waiting to die down there, like 84, like he's got on his riding helmet. He's got on his, his stuff and he's riding his bicycle. But Don pulled right up to us as we're about to leave and his chin was quivering. He said, I just need to say this to you. Like he didn't know we were going to leave. He's just out riding his bike. He said, but the other night, God touched me. And I said, really, Don? And I knew Don's story already. I knew part of it, but Don is now sharing it with me. He said, yes. He said, the other night when I took communion, it's like I felt something. And it, it was like my blood sugar dropped, but that's what it would feel like in the natural. But God did something. And then just forcing through tears, he says, I lost my son this year. Now, Don's 84. His son was 57, but it was his only child. I don't care how old you are. You don't ever expect one of your children to go before you. And Don at 84 is heartbroken. And my friend Rick had invited people in the community to come to this. We did it at the clubhouse at this community where Rick stays. And he liked Don, but he hesitated inviting Don to this event because he knew what the Sozo message was about. And he was concerned that Don might be offended by the Sozo message. But somehow Don even invited himself and he showed up. And here's what he said to me. He said, when I took communion, something happened to me. 
And I prayed with him right there, me and Jen together. And I said, Don, what happened to you is the Lord delivered you from the spirit of grief that had been trying to kill you like the enemy took your son. God's delivered you, and he just shook his head. He knew. He knew that's what it was. And he just pedaled away. Just came by just quick enough to say, this has changed my life. I just want to help you with something. Now, some of you are here for the first time. You've never heard the message of Sozo. The message of Sozo is simple. It is the word saved. Every time you see it in Scripture, it means to be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole. Over 110 times the word saved or some form of saved is, is spoken in the New Testament. And every time you see it, it is that Greek word sozo, S-O-Z-O, to be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole. What it simply means is this. Jesus did such a finished work on that cross that everything you need, you can trace back to that moment on the cross. And it is yours it is yours by right, by right. And what gives you the right is when you receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. You don't just go to heaven when you die. God gives you things on this earth between now and the time you get to heaven. I've watched this save some people's life. I've watched Danny here. Danny here, who's a Marine veteran. I watched his wife pass away last year and we had her funeral. I did her funeral. And, and I knew grief was attacking Danny. They've been married for over 50-some years. I don't even know. The, the, it was a long, long, long time. And he grieved over that. And I would feel for Danny. I would go see him. I went and met up with him, cut grass with him one day. And just I wanted to encourage I was worried about him. But somehow he grabbed a hold of some life. Like he kept coming to church. He'd hear a message. He'd take communion, right? And then one day Grace showed up. And Grace is here with him this morning. Grace came with him to church. Her name is Grace. They actually were high school, not high school, they were elementary school sweethearts even before he met his wife. And they have connected and had a friendship. And every time I see Danny, he's got joy and he's got a smile on his face. He's got a zip in his step. Why? Because Grace came along. Amen. Listen, listen, listen. When you get so familiar with the grace of God that it don't mean nothing to you anymore, you yeah. better get your sword out. Yeah. If you can't say yeah. that this message is changing my life, then you better get your sword out. Because yeah. you've gotten too crusty, you got gotten too full of yourself, and you need to get your sword out. Amen? Right. Because here's the necessity. Here's the reality. You ready? While we build the kingdom, you're going to need this. Amen? Yeah. You're going to need it for yourself. You're going to need it for enemies from without, enemies from within. Jesus is saying to those disciples, ain't nothing going to stop me from doing what my father. I, I didn't do all this for three and a half years to get to this moment to watch somebody rob me of, of what my father's called me to do. He said, if you got a sword, grab a sword. If you ain't got one, go buy one. I said, well, we got two. He said, that's enough. Bring them. Bring them. I want to encourage you this morning. Listen, build and protect you got an adversary that hates your guts. And he doesn't want you to hear the full gospel. He wants to A, keep you out of church. And if he can't keep you out of church, he wants to get you distracted. He wants to get you looking over here, looking over there, and forgetting what Jesus did for you on the cross. So while you're building something, protect what you're building so you don't lose what you're building while you're building something because you ain't protecting it. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Grab your trowel. And grab your sword. Amen. In Jesus' name. Now, that's a Palm Sunday message for you. Amen. And you know what? If that offends you, you are at the wrong church. I promise you, you need to go find another one. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, that is the message God gave me to give Harbor Church. And I'm giving it to anybody that's listening. Amen. And here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to tell you. If you want to come help us, we're going to win the lost around here. And if you don't like winning lost, I promise you at the wrong church. But if you're willing... And you want to be a part of this, I want to ask you to grab a trowel and grab a sword. Because that's how you build the kingdom. Jesus says the kingdom of God suffers violence and violent men take it by force. Amen. Listen, and if you'll get on the anesthesia table, if you'll get on the surgery table and let the great physician do a little surgery every now and then, instead of being so crusty, he'll remove out those fleshy things. He won't even let it build up so long because you're willing to get on the table and say, Lord, do in me and through me whatever you want to do. Amen. I'm not letting disappointment. I'm not letting failure. I'm not letting misunderstandings and whatever this childish mess is that the devil would present me with. I'm not letting any of it distract me from doing what you've called me to do. And can I help you? 
Here's the main thing he's called you to do, and it's the same for all of us. You ready? Go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. And this morning, you're a part of that. You're a part of that. You're a part of the invitation, and it's up to you to be a part of the equation. And you may say, well, I'm not a pastor, and I'm not somebody to get up on stage. That's great. You know what you probably are then? You're probably a support person. And without the support people, the army would fail. Yeah. In the Marine Corps, we had this theology that we called every Marine a rifleman. And no matter if you were a cook, an admin clerk, an aircraft mechanic, you learned how to fire a weapon and you came fishing at it. Because they said this, if we ever get overrun and we need somebody to fight, I want every Marine in here to know how to use that weapon. Amen. So maybe you're a support person. Maybe you're cooking the meal. Maybe you're giving. Listen, your gifts are important. You think this is free? Like, this costs us $400 a week just to rent this building. And if you've never given to Harvard Church, you've got to ask yourself why. Like, why am I not going? Would you ever go to a restaurant and pay and walk out, not pay, walk out and not even leave a tip? Of course you would. So listen, give to the house of God. Amen? Jesus says, when you give, you're providing meat for my house. You're, for, you're providing a place for someone to come and get bread. So maybe you're the giver. Maybe you're the supply person. Maybe you've got a rifle on the front line and you're shooting your rifle at the enemy. Whatever it is you're doing, you're doing it if you so choose. Grab your sword and your trial. Amen. Listen, this is Team Jesus. Praise God. And our goal, our focus is this, to win the lost for Jesus Christ. To build the wall of salvation one brick at a time. Listen, so that we can look back and we can look at it like Mr. Sugg. And then as they ask and watch that brick wall and say, my goodness, you really did do that to the glory of God. Amen. Can I help you? I'm not looking for fame. If I was wanting people to know who I am, I wouldn't have to start a church. Amen. Most people know my name around here. It's the simplest two names in the English alphabet. Right? I am just simply willing to do what the Father has called me to do, and it is to win the lost. There is nothing that stokes me. After we did that ministry, we went to Disney. I know Disney's in controversy, so forgive us if that offends you, all right? But we went to Disney, a family time, and as great as Disney was, they call it the most magical place on earth. That's a lie, right? It's just as dirty as any other place, right? You know what got me thrilled and stoked? was that little Bible study with a group of 25 people in Sebastian, Florida, where I got to share the message of Sozo for people that had never heard it before. They weren't familiar with it. It won't owe hat to them. They were just grateful to get that bread, and then they said, this has changed my life. Amen. I want to encourage you this morning. If it ain't still changing your life, amen, you say, Lord, change me. Change me. Change me. And here's how he wants to change you. From glory to glory to glory. And from faith to faith to faith. You know what he wants to do in your life? He wants this message to get so deep down in you that it oozes out in the right moment and at the right places. When you weren't even thinking God was going to use you. That you are at the coffee, you're at the coffee machine. Or you're over here or you're over there. Or you get a message from a friend. And the gospel comes out of your mouth into that person's life and it changes them. Yeah. Wow. That's a person with a trowel and a sword at work. Amen. The invitation goes out. Will you be a part of that in Jesus' name? Can you imagine what we could accomplish together if we just walked in the love of Christ? Amen. And we stayed focused on our Father's business. Wow. Wow. The Lord's told me. He told me when this church started, He says one-tenth of this city's population will one day attend this church. I wasn't looking for that. I didn't get. I didn't say yes for that. There's ten thousand people in Beaufort County. I believe at some point a thousand people will attend Harvard Church on a regular basis. Praise God! And listen, there are bigger churches than that in other places. That just that's just what God wants to do here. And I'm saying, okay, Lord, if that's what you want to do here, because you ain't called me to any other place but right here, then you just let's do it. Then praise God, let's do it. Amen. Will you be a part of that? If if, if the God's called you here. If that makes you mad, if the thought of that makes you mad, I promise you, you're at the wrong church. Amen? Find the one you can be mad at, okay? But this ain't it. Grab your sword and your trap. And let's do the work of the kingdom, amen? Together, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Will you do, will you let God do for you what he did for that group the other night? I don't care how many times you've heard the word sozo as we receive communion in just a moment. Would you take it 
like you've never heard this before because I know you've got something that needs fixing in your life. Every one of us does at any moment and at any time. Would you take that bread and that cup with a sense of unfamiliarity and say, Father, like the first time right here, I take the bread and the cup. I'm not going to let disappointment rule me because you've got a greater plan. There's things that I can't even see right now. So I'm trusting you. And through the bread and the cup, will you let him do something new and something fresh in your life? In Jesus' name, Christ come up your head. When God's word is proclaimed, it doesn't return void. That means it goes and it does what it's supposed to do. When God's word is proclaimed, there's a response for each and every one of us. Whether we know Jesus and he's our Lord and Savior, we have never professed Jesus as our Lord and Savior before. And we want to give you that opportunity right now. And uh, ushers, you can go ahead and I want you just to bring those baskets by each row so that people can grab their communion during this time. And if that's you and maybe you have never Ask Jesus to come into your heart and be Lord and Savior of your life. We want to give you that opportunity right now. I believe there's an awakening happening for people. When you wake up and your eyes, you get the, the tiredness out of your eyes and you wake up and you begin to look around and you begin to see, oh my goodness, how good God is. You begin to taste and see that he's good. You begin to realize that just as as I have this trowel in my hand that God actually wants to build upon my life. How he looked at Peter and said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And guess what? You are his church. And he's placed his spirit inside of you. He's breathed breath inside of your lungs. He's calling you to be a builder. See, there's purpose on your life. And some people in here maybe have never heard that they have a purpose on their life. That you just think I'm supposed to... Grow up, go to school, graduate, get married, have a family, work a job, retire, and go live by the beach until I die. God has so much more in store for you this morning. And if that's you and you feel that you hear the Spirit of God beckoning you saying, it's time to come home. It's time to come home, son. It's time to come home, daughter. We're going to give you that opportunity right now. We do that by way of communion. As Pastor Johnny preached, everything that we need in our life is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to say a prayer. And I want you to repeat that prayer in your heart or under your breath, but I want you to pray it in faith. I want you to pray it in faith for the person that needs to submit their life to Jesus or for the person that simply is crying out saying, I need this fixed in my life. This is broken in my life and I need wholeness. This, this area of my life needs healing. This area of my life, I need protection. This area of my life, I need Jesus to come in and make new again. See, when we receive Jesus, it says, Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. And that is available to you this morning, right now. So with all heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want you to say this prayer with me. Dear Jesus... I know that you died on a cross for my sins. Jesus, I know that you rose again so that I could be free. I know that without you, I am doomed for destruction. But because of what you've done on the cross, because of your resurrection, I now have newness of life. Lord, I turn from my old ways. God, I repent and I come to the high place. God, I want to do it your way. God, I want to do it the best way. I want you to come into my life, take over, and make me new. And if that's you and you prayed that prayer this morning, and you're giving your life to Jesus, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell somebody. I want you to tell somebody. It's the gift the enemy cannot take from you and nobody else can give you but God. And that's your story. 
That's your transformation. I want you to tell somebody close to you, come on, talk to Pastor Johnny, talk to myself. But we want to, hey, I gave my life to Jesus this morning. And for the person this morning that needs healing in their life, that needs to receive sozo salvation, in just a second, we're going to take communion. But if that's you, right now we're going to, in faith, take the body that was broken for us so that we could be made whole and the blood that was poured out so that we could be made new, so that we could be washed clean of every bit of sin in our lives, past, present, and what you're going to do tomorrow, 20 years from now. That's what we get to do when we come to the feet of Jesus and call upon his name. And we know that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, so. do you need saving this morning? Call out to the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your body and your blood. And right now, in the name of Jesus, by faith, we receive your body, we receive your blood with thanksgiving to say thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross. And as it symbolizes the wholeness and the freedom that we have through your son, Jesus, we place this at your feet, believing for signs, wonders, miracles, breakthrough, healing, Provision right now in the name of Jesus, we declare it. You may take the blood, you may take the body, you may take communion. put our hands together right now and say thank you Jesus there's no better response than to just say thank you Father for what you've done for me that's what I focus on, that's what I set my attention on this morning is the goodness and the graciousness of our Heavenly Father man what an incredible time in the Lord's house, have you been blessed this morning are you thankful amen I want to leave you with just a couple things before you go and uh, if you would, just hold tight, hold tight. Very, very important. Um, in the back, as I mentioned earlier, we've got some balloons up there. Brianna and a few of our youth are going to be back there at this table. We've got some chicken plate tickets. And, uh, hey, if you're like, look, I'm hungry. <laughs> and I know I'm going to be hungry on April 22nd for lunch. I would love if you would just go and support our youth as they go off to camp this summer. Um, I want to I see those tickets gone. I want to have to go to the printer and print some more out, so we got to sell them. Um, but that is there for you. Um, if you would like to help out, I know I had a number of people. Please come talk to me, um, and we would love to have your assistance that day, whether it's making the boxes, whether it's delivering them to businesses. Um, we're just bringing everybody together to do this. Um, it's going to be a really, really uh, incredible time. Another thing is this. Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is one of the uh, highest attended church uh, days of the year. And, and if you notice, in our parking lot, it can get quite tight out there. And so we are uh, introducing a, a new concept uh, called smart parking. Okay? Smart parking. And uh, how we smart park is, is, is I know sometimes I like to have some space. We got them big old doors, you know, the mirrors that fold in. Is we're going to smart park. And, and what we need to do is when we come in, especially next Sunday, is we need to be parking our cars right next to one another. Right? So if you see a car, don't go find the big open space over there. Park that car. Plenty of room for you to open the door. But that way we allow for anybody coming in here to it so it's not um, uh, difficult for them to park, but we make enough room for them to come in. I'm thinking about the people who don't know Jesus, but just look at, oh my gosh, Easter's this Sunday. And they type in church in Washington, North Carolina, and they find Harbor Church. That's the people I'm thinking about. I want to make sure they have a parking spot on Sunday. And so would you help Smart Park this next Sunday? So you see a car park, boom, just park right next to it. So it continues like a line all the way around this building. Okay, so really, really pumped. Hey, join us, 7 a.m., Resurrection Sunday, sunrise service at Festival Park. And then we're going to be right back here. Again, that's over to the whole community. And we're right back here for Resurrection Sunday at Harbor Church. And I cannot wait to celebrate Jesus. Cannot wait to celebrate Jesus. Look, we love you guys. Let me pray for you, and then we'll be dismissed. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this sweet, sweet worship. 
thank you that you brought life when there was death, that you've resurrected dry bones, that you have resurrected us, and you have seated us in high places with you. We love you, Jesus. We bless your name. And we cry, Abba, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.